Hey everyone, uh, my name is Tom, Tom Van Katzen. Uh, and indeed, I'm actually going to sort of pick off, pick it, uh, pick it up where, where Chris left off and, and dive a little bit deeper into, into hardened JS uh, through some code examples. And in order to do that, uh, let me invite you to maybe check out either Jeff's retweet or, or the tweet on my Twitter account, that's T-V-C-U-T-S-E-M. Um, so the last few tweets I posted contain a link to uh, Keynote Live URL that will allow you to follow, follow along as I do the, the, the talk. If you prefer to just download the PDF slides, I also put a link to just the PDF. Uh, but as I will go through this step by step, it's really easier if you can just follow along in a browser. Um, let me just spend two minutes to talk about myself, keep it short, really. Um, so who am I? I'm a uh, computer scientist and programming language designer. I work at Bell Labs. That's the research arm of Nokia. Um, and in the past life, I've heavily contributed to uh, JavaScript. I was on the standards committee, the TC39, for those of you that, that know that. And I worked there this about 10 years ago. I, I worked uh, heavily alongside uh, Mark Miller, who is Agoric's uh, chief scientist. I also worked a lot with Chris back then. That was indeed when we sort of uh, were standardizing on promises and all of the other goodies that, that got into uh, ES6 or ECMAScript 6. Um, also relevant to this talk is Roughly 10 years ago, Mark, I, and, and a few co-conspirators were already trying to turn JavaScript into a language in which to write smart contracts. Uh, that was before you know, Ethereum came around, and, and indeed, so it wasn't really based on decentralized uh, ledgers. And I think what Mark and Dean and others at Agoric are doing is sort of taking that vision and sort of putting it on a solid foundation of you know blockchains with full decentralization and much bigger trust than what we could achieve back in the day. Uh, but just to say that I've, I've been thinking about this stuff uh, for a long time. Now in, in this talk, it's going to be, I'm going to be talking about JavaScript and, and security, um, but you're not gonna hear me talk about the typical things that people associate with JavaScript security, like, you know, uh, content security policy and uh, XSRF attacks and all these Web2 kind of exploits. Instead, I'm going to take a very much a software engineering, software architecture view of application security. Now, credit where credit is due, a lot of what I'm going to talk about are ideas that Mark uh, has been exploring for a long time. Uh, and if you're really interested into that, you should dig into his PhD thesis, which you know explore this to the to the full detail, where he basically indicates that to him security is really just an extreme form of software modularity. And one way of thinking about this is modular software av avoids needless dependencies in order to prevent bugs, and secure software uh, you know, uh, tries to avoid needless vulnerabilities to prevent exploits. And a vulnerability is a kind of dependency. If you are not dependent on someone else's code, then you're also not vulnerable to that, that someone else's code. So in that sense, modularity and security are very much aligned. Now, um, I'm going to pick up on a topic that, that Chris also uh, touched upon, which is this notion of Modern JavaScript applications are composed of uh, a myriad of modules. They have to cooperate and come together to create your app. And that is true regardless of whether you're building a web page or a web server or a smart contract on a blockchain. Right? So what I show here on the slide is just schematically, if you're building a web page, it might consist of multiple modules, but all of those modules will have the same authority to read cookies or to uh, access the DOM, in other words, to interact with the user. And on the server side, you have Node.js apps. They com they're comprised of uh, many different modules, but all of them, those modules have the authority to send HTTP requests or read your file system. And so, so, it, so it is on the blockchain, if you're developing a smart contract in, in JavaScript, 
Hopefully, you're going to be using lots of modules to do that because you want to reuse battle-tested code. But all of those modules will have access to whatever the, the blockchain environment offers you as capabilities to interact with wallets, to interact with token balances, and so on. Right. So we need to really think about, do we actually trust all of, all of that code? And most of my talk will actually be about reasoning about what happens when code goes rogue, when code that you have deliberately imported doesn't do the right thing. And this is not just a theoretical threat. We've, we've seen this happen on a number of occasions. Uh, some of you may remember the event stream incident that happened a few years back where a package was compromised by a contributor and he, they pushed an update and anyone that installed that package was a subject to an, uh, an attack where you know, the, the code would start sniffing around on your hard drive for uh, cryptocurrency uh, wallets. So definitely something we need to take serious. Now, the way we're going to go about reasoning about this, and, and, and uh, Chris definitely also picked up on that, is um, we're going to try and make sure that code that we import has all of the capabilities it needs to do its job but nothing more. And this is what's sometimes called the principle of least authority or POLA for short, okay? So that's sort of our guiding principle of how we're going to try and uh, create a more secure, dependable code. And I know this is rather theoretical, so let me just jump to a small running example that I will use to, to walk you through this. And the setup is, is the following. Let's just assume we're building a JavaScript app and we, we're importing two modules, uh, Alice and Bob. Um, and so uh, we don't necessarily fully trust Alice and Bob, but we want to give them access to a shared log object. And the, the security property, just for the sake of, of explanation, the property that we're interested in is that Alice should only be able to write to the log and Bob should only be able to read messages from the log. Okay, and in this example, the log is really just a an array of messages, and you know the write function or the write method on the on the slide here just pushes messages on the end of the array, and the read uh, method returns that that array. And it's it's a very dumbed down example, but you can certainly imagine if you're building a complex application that log might represent a transaction log, right? Uh, which you don't want Bob to clobber or or mess about with. So these kinds of properties come up all the time in most uh, software uh, pieces. So um, again, as I mentioned, the, the purpose of this exercise is to get you thinking through what happens if Bob goes rogue, how much damage can they do? Uh, can they actually overstep their, their authority uh, given the code that, that, I, that I show here on the slide? And so, um, so the way the code is set up, we just created this um, log class. It has a constructor. Um, you can, uh, uh, so it's so this write method and this, this read method. We instantiate the class into a, an object called log with a lowercase l. And then we uh, we pass the log onto Alice and Bob. So they have a shared pointer to that, that shared JavaScript object. Now, the way this code is written, actually, Bob has way too much authority. There's a lot of things that Bob can do uh, to overstep his authority, and we'll go through each of those attacks step by step and see how we can mitigate them. And we're actually going to start all the way at the bottom, so you just need to look at the, the code that is in the, in the, in the highlighted box there. Um, so the first attack we're going to deal with is uh, prototype poisoning attacks. So, here, what Bob is trying to do is they're mucking about with the built-in array.prototype function that is you know, available by default in every JavaScript runtime. And they're going to override that function such that the push method doesn't actually tag any messages onto the, the array anymore. And Bob can do, by doing so, he can make Alice's messages disappear, right? So if Alice calls the right method, um, that's call, going to call into Bob's uh, push method and um, not log anything. So that's the first thing we need to we need to deal with. And so this is actually where hard JavaScript comes into play. And um, going to just reiterate a bit what what Chris already mentioned. So um, 
Hardened JavaScript is this environment that you can put code in to make sure that you don't have this sort of prototype poisoning. And uh, the way this works technically is through a, uh, an abstraction called a shadow realm. And you can think of a shadow realm really as um, if you're a web developer as like an iframe, but without all the, the DOM uh, baggage associated with it. If you're a node developer, you might have uh, heard of the VM module in, in Node, which allows you to create these additional uh, global environments, right? So Shadow Realm is really just a way of creating a new global environment for your JavaScript code to execute in. As I show here on the slide, each Shadow Realm has its own set of primordials. So primordials is just a name that um, for all these built-in objects like array, math, JSON, and so on. What you also see on this slide is the green objects, the, the normal objects that you create in your programs, they can point to each other and they can also point to objects in other realms, right? Uh, so, so you can have a pointer to objects in other realms and you can invoke methods on those objects like you would on objects in your own realm, okay? And this is, these shadow realms are on a standard track. Uh, so people are working to get this standardized because uh, there is no standard way of creating these environments in JavaScript today. If you're on the web or in Node, you have to use different mechanisms. Shadow Realms aim to, to solve that. Now, the problem with Shadow Realms is if, you're, if you have hundreds of module dependencies and you're going to put each module into its own Shadow Realm, that's a lot of overhead because you have to duplicate all those primordials. So what hardened JS therefore does is it gives you this additional more lightweight means of um, uh, compartmentalizing code uh, called compartments. Chris already touched on that as well. So compartments are separate uh, environments within a single shadow realm. And um, the different compartments in the same realm actually share the same primordials as I show here on the slide the array and the math object are actually shared among all of those compartments. Now, how do we then prevent the poisoning attack, the prototype poisoning? Well, um, hardened JavaScript will lock down all of these built-in objects initially. And so it will freeze all of these objects. Uh, so they become completely immutable. And uh, that makes them safe to share across different compartments, right? And so, um, so this is really going to the core of what hardened JavaScript is. It is a subset of full JavaScript uh, that basically uh, where you don't have any mutable built-in objects, so all the built-ins or primordials are immutable. You don't have any global powerful objects by default, like the window object in the browser or the process object in Node. And you have this ability to create these lightweight compartments. So that is that is essentially what what uh, hardened JavaScript is. And I'll I'll defer to Chris's talk for all the pointers on where you can find the shim that implements all of this on today's uh, uh, JavaScript uh, platforms. So the key idea, though, uh, and I can't repeat this enough, is basically code that is running inside hardened JavaScript can only affect the outside world through objects or capabilities that we explicitly grant to it from the outside. Okay, that is, that is the core security property on which everything relies. Now, um, if all of this sounds complicated and you don't really uh, you know, know how to get around this, uh, there's this tool, and, and Chris already mentioned this, uh, from the people at MetaMask, okay, this tool called Lava Mode, what Lava Mode will do is it plugs into your build uh, tool, Webpack or Browserify, and it will automatically basically put all of your module dependencies into its own uh, compartment. And uh, in addition, it provides this very nice um, uh, config file that you see on the right, which basically gives you an at-a-glance view of uh, all the powerful objects that these modules depend on. And you can actually further restrict access by changing that config file. So it's really a way of sort of uh, getting a good view on your modules uh, dependencies and their the authority that they need. Okay, so back to our example, right? Um, so uh, with um, uh, Alice and Bob's code now running in their own compartment, 
we can start mitigating this, this poison prototype poisoning attack. We can scratch that attack off of our list, and we can continue to look at the other uh, things that Bob can do. Now, the way this, this code is written, um, a, a far simpler attack, actually, is that Bob can just uh, replace or override the write function uh, on, on the shared log object, uh, because JavaScript objects are, are born mutable, right? So, um, so the, the, the way you solve that is you, you, you freeze the object. So object.freeze is a standard JavaScript built in function. It, it's been around for, for a long time. Uh, and it will lock down all of the properties of, uh, of an object. Now, the problem is it only locks down the immediate properties of the object. If those properties point to a mutable value, the attacker can still sort of read the mutable property and start modifying that. And as I show on the last line on the right here, Bob can still modify properties of the right function because function objects in JavaScript are objects with mutable properties as well. So we need to sort of recursively lock down our uh, right methods and, and so on. And in order not to do that sort of by hand, hardened JavaScript, as the name sort of implies, gives you this function called harden, which you give an object and uh, harden will walk all of the public properties of the object, freeze them, and then recursively harden all the properties, uh, all the values that it can reach through that object. And it does that um, on and on until it freezes everything that is reachable from that object. So what you get after you harden an object is an object on which you can only invoke methods or read uh, immutable fields. Okay, and so if we do that, uh, Bob's uh, this this attack is also uh, forwarded. Now, the other thing that Bob can do is they can uh, uh, call the read function, and the read function returns a pointer to the messages array, and that it's meant to be a private field, like private state to the log object, but um, Bob can actually get to it and then they can just call, for instance, set the length of the array to zero, which will completely truncate the log, therefore also uh, updating it, right? Um, so the way you, you, you solve this problem, it's actually a very common problem in, in, in a lot of API designs, is you try not to return pointers to mutable state. Instead, you make a copy. So in here, I just use the JavaScript splice operator to make a copy of that array. That's pretty inefficient. If you're going to call read a lot, you're going to get a lot of copies. So the, the proper way to actually handle this is to use a library like immutable JS, for instance. It's a good library that offers uh, a bunch of very complicated data structures that you can update uh, almost in constant time and yet have, have the, the, the updates be immutable. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. I'll, I'll just go with the simple solution here, and that gets rid of this uh, next to last attack. So the, then the, the final thing that Bob can do is they can just call the write function because we've given them a pointer to the log object, and the log object has a write and a read method. Okay. Uh, to solve that, well, it looks like we can just why don't we just give Alice a pointer, not to the log object itself, but to the write function, and we can give Bob a pointer to only the read function. Now, there's actually a bug in this code, uh, and I don't know if, if people can spot it immediately, um, but basically the problem is if you pluck a function from a, a JavaScript object the way I do it here, and then Alice or Bob call, call those functions, uh, the, this, the this parameter in the write or the read method will actually be set to undefined and this code will crash. And JavaScript has this uh, uh, function called bind, which you can use to bind a function to a receiver object such that whenever you call that function, it's going to set, make sure that the this object points to the right object. So the way I write the code here, um, basically, uh, we, we make sure that Alice and Bob can call those functions without issues and it'll point to the right object. So with that, um, the way I've written the code here, all of, the, all of evil Bob's attacks are thwarted. Now, there's one final observation, though, that you can make here, which is that the burden of correctly using the log object is on the client of, uh, of the class, right? So if we've written this log class,
And it was actually the client of the class that had to call the harden and make sure that they create these bound functions and, and so on and so forth. And you can ask yourself, okay, can we actually, can we avoid this? Can we, can we write this code differently such that um, uh, all that burden uh, it actually lies with the creator of the log abstraction rather than the client. And the answer to that is, um, is the function as object pattern. So what I show here, the code on the left is the code that you saw on the previous slide. The code on the right is a refactored piece of code where um, I've replaced the class definition with a simple function definition called makelog. Whenever you call the makelog function, we will return a fresh object that contains a bunch of methods. Those methods are defined as local functions. And instead of using an instance variable, we'll just declare local variables uh, that will hold, hold on to our state. And contrary to the messages underscore field uh, on the left, the messages variable on the right is actually private. You you, you, there's no way for any code outside that function to actually reach in and grab that, that, that variable. Um, so uh, the code is actually even shorter uh, than, than the code on the left. Uh, and you don't have to deal with this calling this bind function, because if you look carefully closely at the write and the read functions, they don't actually use the this object anymore. They just you know, read from the local variable, and that's it. And so this pattern uh, has been around in JavaScript for a long time. Uh, some of you, uh, if, if you follow Doc Brockford or you read any of his books, uh, like JavaScript the Good Parts, he's long advocated for using this pattern instead of using classes or instead of using prototypes. And um, if you're interested in, in, in more, I think Martin Fowler also has a good post on the function as object pattern on, on his blog. Um, so we're going to go with this pattern for the rest of the talk and uh, then talk a little bit about, okay, uh, if you use this pattern, um, sort of how can we evolve this code as more requirements come into the picture? So for instance, let's assume that uh, over time our, our API starts to grow and we also add a function to read the size of the log. We want to know how many messages are in our log, so we add a size uh, function. Uh, now, uh, so the difference is shown here on the slide, so we just you know, add this size function. We have to add it as a property to the objects that we return from the make log function, but we also have to sort of update the signature of the Alice and Bob modules so we can pass along the additional property, right? So the way the code is currently written, uh, if Alice needs to both write to the log and see the size, and Bob needs to be able to read from the log and get the size, we need to pass them two pointers to these individual functions. And that's a bit of an annoyance because every time we add new properties, we would have to change the API signatures of our modules. And that's, that's really not a good way of, of structuring your code. So there's this pattern you can use uh, that's often used uh, when you write code in this style and when you, you're very conscious about the access control of your objects, that's called facets. So what are facets? They're really just nested objects. So as is highlighted here on the right, uh, in the code on the right, what we do now is instead of um, letting makelog return a flat object with read, write, and size properties, we're returning an object with two properties, reader and writer. And the reader will contain the set of properties that a reader can call, and writer will call the set of properties that the writer uh, can call. And now we can just uh, um, you know, pass the writer interface to Alice and pass the reader interface to Bob, and we get the properties that we want. And over time, the benefit of this is if we add more capabilities or we refactor these interfaces, we don't need to change the API of Alice or Bob, okay? So uh, now the final thing I, I want to, uh, to mention is, uh, this is also a very common pattern uh, if you, when, when you're reasoning about authority, is maybe you don't want to limit authority in terms of what methods can be called, but temporarily, like 
and when can these, these methods actually be called? For instance, what if we want to give Bob only temporary read access to the log? So maybe Bob is a plugin that we loaded uh, and uh, when the user uninstalls the plugin, you know, we don't want Bob to uh, be able to read the log anymore, right? Um, and so the way we can do that is uh, we can, instead of giving Bob a direct pointer to our read function, and by the way, for simplicity, I've, I've reverted here to the simpler example where we don't have the size function, we don't use the facets, so we just have a simple read, Alice gets the pointer to the write function, Bob gets the pointer to the read function, and so uh, the way we go about limiting Bob's authority in time is uh, that we don't give Bob a direct pointer to the read function, we give him a proxy uh, or what is also called a caretaker um, to the log object or to the read function. The way this is done in the code, as you can see, we create a log object by calling the make log function. And then we're going to create a revocable log, a log from which we can revoke access. Um, and that's going to return a revocable log object, R log together with a function called revoke that we can call to uh, shut down access to the log. To Alice, we're going to just pass a pointer to the original write function of the log, but to Bob, we're going to pass a, fun a pointer to the uh, read function of the revocable log. And then at a later point in time, let's say when, when the user no longer has need for Bob, we call revoke, maybe that's done in a callback, right? And uh, that will actually modify this intermediate, as is shown in the diagram on the on the upper right, uh, where that proxy actually drops the pointer to the function and becomes sort of a safe dangling pointer, if you will. Now, this revocable log function is actually very simple. Um, what it does is it creates a proxy object that has exactly the same API as the object that we're proxying. So it also has a read and a write method. Um, these methods will just delegate to the original object, uh, but there's also this revoke function. And when we call revoke, we set that uh, log variable to null. So we drop the pointer. And if, if Bob still tries to call any of these methods, they'll just get an exception and not be able to get at our data. And so that, that actually, this caretaker is actually one way of doing what is called taming an API. And uh, it's really critical if, you, if you're thinking about uh, sort of developing contracts, you really want to think about, okay, if I'm going to import this module, what set of API accesses am I going to expose to that module? And taming is the process of taking an API that has potentially has a lot of powerful uh, API endpoints and um, restricting those API endpoints, either, for instance, by making the API read only or limiting it in time, sort of, you know, adding additional access control. So that is a, that that pattern is it's called taming. Now uh, to wrap up, um, and I think uh, Chris again touched on this. So these patterns, although they seem rather theoretical, if you know where to look, they're actually used all over the place in industry. Um, and you know, most relevant to to, to this audience and to, in Web three. Uh, clearly is Agoric's use of hardened JavaScript as the foundational layer to build smart contracts and, and, and decentralized applications. Uh, MetaMask also uh, was mentioned, so they're a wallet provider, right? So they also use uh, Lava mode to sandbox plugins in the, in the crypto wallet. And, but there's in, in the Web2 world, there's also plenty of places where, where these patterns are being used. And so the takeaway message uh, of, of my talk really is that JavaScript apps are composed of many modules, and that is true for Web2 as well as it is for Web3. And you can't trust all of those modules. So the way in which you can uh, tread safely is to apply what's called principle of least authority. So you just limit trust. You only give access to modules to the things they need to get to their job and nothing more. And the way you can do that practically is you have to isolate modules from one another for that you can use hardened JavaScript and tools like Lava Mode. But then once you have put these modules into the sandbox, you still typically want those modules to create objects that you can then use, right? You need to compose them. 
And the things I talked about, these patterns like facets and caretakers and so on, they're really sort of design patterns that help you uh, sort of balance uh, composing objects with uh, composing them safely, sort of avoiding uh, unnecessary hazards. And I believe understanding these patterns is critical in a Web3 world where your code will directly interact with objects of value, with digital assets, all right? And so with that, I've reached the end of my talk. Yeah, and if people have questions, always feel free to just uh, you know, tag me on Twitter and I'll, I'll keep an eye on my Twitter feed.